thank you very much. It's really an honor to be in the first event of this new group. So I thank Rocky and Adam and all of the organizers uh, for inviting me. I'm going to talk to you about a very, very important subject, of course, uh, the role of religion in violence. And I have developed a, a new theory for that role, which is in my book, Fighting Words, uh, published in 2005. So the, the issue of religious violence uh, became even more important after 9-11. Uh, there was a renewed attention to the role of religion in violence, and major new studies were produced after that date. So, uh, of course, we have the ISIS-ISIL uh, Islamic threat. It declares itself to be fighting a religious war, and so there's new impetus for uh, trying to study the role of religion in that movement. Uh, this is important because there are some people who deny that there is such a thing as religious violence. So one example is William Cavanaugh, who wrote The Myth of Religious Violence here. And he says, religion is an artificial construct. It really doesn't exist. And since religion doesn't exist, there is no such thing as religious violence. So that is one thing that I will try to explain uh, why that is, that's a flawed argument. Uh, then there are a couple of popular approaches to explaining religious violence. Uh, one is called essentialism. So this, it, you, you hear it very often in the media, uh, various people, important figures have voiced it, but essentialism says religion or particular religions are essentially good. And the religious violence is caused by this deviant form, the bad forms of the religion. The second type of argument you hear is this anti-colonialist argument. Uh, the idea is, for example, modern Islamic violence is principally a reaction against uh, Western secularization and colonialism. So if you didn't have that, uh, you wouldn't have these Islamic movements, for example. So here's an example of essentialism. Uh, from Harold Ellens, uh, important biblical scholar. He wrote a multi-volume work called The Destructive Power of Religion. <laughs> so he says, the real God is a God of unconditional grace. The only thing that works in life for God or for humans. So in his view, the true God is a good God, it's a graceful God. So anyone that believes in a violence must be believing in the, in the wrong God, a false version of God. That's an example of what I call essentialism. So here's another one. Uh, Bruce Lawrence, a very prominent professor uh, in his book, Shattering the Myth, says Islam is not inherently violent and the longer view of Muslim societies offers hope rather than despair about the role of Islam in the next century. So here's essentialism again. The true Islam is not violent, it's peaceful. It's the bad forms of Islam that cause the problems. And you even have it from prominent secularists like Sam Harris, this idea. So here, talking about Buddhism, he says, the comparison to the Buddhists who are uh, in Myanmar now killing Muslims is, fast, is a facile one because those Buddhists are killing Muslims, it's horrible. It's a sign of tribal violence, but it's not a sign of the honest implementation of the doctrine of Buddhism. So see, there's a true Buddhism, there's an honest view of Buddhism, and then there's a false view, a dishonest view of Buddhism. And that's what causes the problem. So we have President Barack Obama voicing a version of essentialism when he says, now let's make two things clear. ISIL is not Islamic. No religion, he says, condones the killing of innocents. And the vast majority of ISIL's victims have been Muslim. So again, uh, any, any religion that advocates killing of, of, it's not really a religion. It's a false version of a religion. So here it is, the president espousing this view again. So this is why this view of essentialism is flawed. The idea that religious violence is a deviant form of a religion supposes that there is a true form of a religion. But the idea that there is a true form is a faith-based and unverifiable claim. Such a claim is no less justified than if someone says, no, the, the true form of the religion is the violent one. How would you adjudicate that claim? You can't. They're both faith-based. So uh, 
The other thing you do when you divide religions into true and false versions is you create an orthodox heterodox model. And so anytime you declare yourself to be following the true form of religion, you make heretics out of those who disagree. So now ISIL is a heretical form of Islam. And that has caused uh, uh, violence throughout history. So declaring someone to be practicing an untrue form of a religion simply replicates a mechanism for violence. So instead of solving the problem, you're actually perpetuating the problem by thinking that way. So <laughs> we have another kind of approach uh, that centers on interpretation. You know, the, the idea that there's a true interpretation of a, a text, of a biblical text or an Islamic text. So here is Heather Gregg who said, religious violence is the result of specific interpretations of a religion's beliefs and scriptures, not the religious per se. So it, if you interpret the religion just right, you, you wouldn't have these problems. You know? And this is why that is flawed. So the proper interpretation of the Bible or any uh, biblical text rests on theological grounds. It's a faith-based claim. It's, it's, no one interpretation is better than any other when you base it on faith. It begs the question of why we uh, or any modern polis, uh, social policies are based on interpretation. Why are we basing our morals on ancient texts in the first place? That should be the problem. And here is uh, Jack Nelson Palmeyer who says religiously justified violence is first and foremost a problem of sacred text and not a problem of misinterpretation. So he takes the opposite view, one closer to mine. It's, it's not about misinterpreting text. It's the texts themselves that are the problem. So <clears throat> this is why anti-colonialism is flawed. That's why you cannot say uh, if we hadn't invaded Iraq or uh, if we hadn't gone into Afghanistan, uh, there wouldn't be these problems. The truth is that Islam and other Abrahamic religions have the propensity to be colonialist and imperialistic. And that is because they believe there's only one God and he created and owns the world. And therefore any other religion uh, that is not part of that religion has to be either extinguished or conquered. The, the, the ultimate goal of a monotheistic religion is to conquer the entire world because God the only God that exists and the only God that created the world owns the world. And therefore, uh, all Abrahamic religions are going to be imperialistic. Historically, it's also questionable because Islam colonized the West before the West colonized Islamic countries. So already uh, in, 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 in the late first millennium of, of, of our era, uh, you had uh, Muslims going into southern uh, uh, into Spain, and even to southern France, and so forth. So it's not true that we conquered or try to conquer Islamic countries first. So <laughs> America also fought uh, a war with Islamic countries in 1801, 1805. Most people don't know that under Thomas Jefferson. And if you look at the rhetoric that was being voiced at that time, you'd see it's very similar to what we're hearing today. There's nothing different. So it's not about us going to Iraq or, or Afghanistan necessarily. Is this, this is a war that has been there for, for hundreds of years. And it has to do with the inherent violent nature of some of these uh, religions. So my, uh, my theory is based on the work of Regina Schwartz, uh, who wrote The Curse of Cain in 1997. And, and she argued <coughs> monotheism is inherently violent. Why? Because monotheism says there's only one God and his followers are the true followers of God. So you create insiders and outsiders automatically. Those that don't follow this God are already going to be outsiders. And so she says that in itself is an act of violence. Uh, just by creating that division, you're going to create the potential for violence. So uh, my theory is, is it's quite simple. Uh, it says that most violence is the result of scarce resources, real or perceived. So uh, anywhere that I've ever studied any conflict, somebody thinks something is scarce. There's not enough of something. So when religion causes violence, it does so because it has created new scarce resources. In other words, religion itself created the perception that something is scarce, that there's not enough of it. So, 
The basic mechanism of all violence, including religious violence, is that there will be an effort to acquire or maintain that scarce resource. So somebody either wants to keep what's scarce or someone wants to get what's scarce, and that's gonna drive the conflict. Now, you can go from the smallest scale of uh, human organization to the largest, and you'll find the same exact mechanism. So, for example, uh, in a family, uh, the smallest levels of human organization. Let's say there's not enough love uh, in, in a couple. You know, one partner thinks they have more than the other, uh, more respect than the other. That's a scarce resource that you know, somebody wants it or somebody wants to keep it. So if someone in a family has more privileges because of their birth order, they're the oldest, that's a scarce resource. That status is the scarce resource. And there's gonna be conflict because those that don't have it want it, those that have it wanna keep it. So even in, in, you know, in a couple, as I said, if one has something the other doesn't have, that's a scarce resource and people are gonna fight about that or can. If you go to the national level, uh, the, same, the same issue, the same mechanism. So for example, right now in the West, there's a water shortage. People are gonna be fighting about water. They're already fighting about water. Political power can be a scarce resource. Right now, the Democrats have the White House, the Republicans don't. The White House is a scarce resource, there's only one. Uh, and so the, the ones that have it wanna keep it, the ones that don't have it wanna acquire it, and that creates conflict. Justice can be a scarce resource. When, when people don't feel there's enough justice, like for example in Baltimore or Ferguson, then that creates the conflict. You know, there's not enough justice. Everywhere you look, there's always something that's scarce. Somebody thinks there's not enough of it, and that creates the conflict, always. So you can go to the global scale. Some people say, we went to Iraq because we wanted more energy supplies, we wanted oil. When, e when energy is scarce, well that becomes a scarce resource people are gonna fight about. Food can be a scarce resource. Uh, some people don't have enough food, they wanna acquire it. Information, in, in, a, in, a, in a modern digital age, some people have access to information, computers, and some don't. And uh, some people want information, you know, the, the hacking of Sony, you know, uh, supposedly North Korea wanted information that, that, that was a scarce resource. And of course, weapons. Uh, right now, the conflict with Iran is that some people don't want them to have nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons is a scarce resource. So we want to keep them away from them, they want to acquire them. Everywhere you look, someone wants something and someone wants to keep something that they think is scarce. And that drives every conflict I've ever studied. So what people don't often think about is that verifiability is also a scarce resource. So uh, when neither of two opposing claims can be verified about a scarce resource, then violence may become the means to adjudicate this claim. For example, if someone says, God says that I should kill all homosexuals, that's an unverifiable claim. And someone else says, no, God wants us to love all homosexuals, unverifiable claim. So you cannot adjudicate those kinds of claims. So the verifiability of the claim is itself a scarcity, and that's gonna drive conflict. So uh, religion can generate uh, the feeling of scarcity because it is premised on the existence of supernatural forces or beings whose existence cannot be verified. So because of that, religion by its very nature creates scarce resources. Every time someone says, this invisible being told me that you don't belong here or there, or you can't be this or that, that is itself going to generate conflict because other people are not gonna be able to verify that claim. So <clears throat> this is what my theory does not say, because so often it's misunderstood. I do not say that all violence is due to religion. Violence is due to scarce resources. And so some scarcities are not caused by religion. Food may be scarce for many other reasons than religion. Uh, political power may be scarce for reasons other than religion, et cetera. Nor does my theory say that only religious causes violence. It, it does not say that. And my theory does not say that religion always causes violence. Uh, it's, that's not what I'm saying. A better summary of the theory is when religion causes violence, it does so because it has created a scarce resource somewhere. So the, the, 
The key to solving the problem is finding where religion created the scarcity. So if you look historically, you'll see that religion has created at least four scarce resources that have repeatedly caused conflict over and over. And I enumerate them as scriptural access to God's will, sacred space, group privilege, and salvation. These four scarce resources you'll see throughout history repeatedly cause, generate violence. So let's look at the first one. Inscripturation refers to access to divine communication. The idea that divine communication is restricted to certain texts only. So for example, only the Bible has the word of God. Other books don't. You know, F. Scott Fitzgerald does not have the word of God. Or uh, whoever wrote Fifty Shades of Grey does not have the word of God. Only the Bible has the word of God. So it doesn't matter how many copies you have of the Bible, the idea that it's only in this book has created a scarce resource. And of course, um, I can show you that already in the Bible, this will lead to conflict. In Deuteronomy 18.20, it says, any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. Well, what? Why? Well, because he's not authorized to speak for God. He does not have that access. That access is a scarce resource. And only we have it. So whoever doesn't have it should die. That's, that's the idea here. <laughs> and of course, uh, if, you, if you look at Islamic history, uh, you can point to the Qurayza massacre where, where Jews were massacred. Uh, and prior to the massacre, um, the Jews were warned as follows. Follow this man, Muhammad, and accept them as true, for by God it has become plain to you that he is a prophet who has been sent, and that it is he that you find mentioned in your scripture, in other words, in the Hebrew Bible. And then your lives, your property, your women and children will be saved. The obverse of that is if you don't follow this man, Muhammad, then your lives and your children will not be saved, when, and they were slaughtered uh, because they did not want to accept. So you see, the idea that only Muhammad or the Quran has the word of God led to this. You know, your Bible doesn't have the word of God, ours does. Sacred space is probably the most uh, prominent generator of religious violence uh, you know, in the last two, 3,000 years. Anytime you declare a space to be more valuable than surrounding space for religious reasons, you've just created a scarce resource. Now, if you ever think about it, why is the Holy Land called holy? Have you ever thought about that? Because uh, my wife who's sitting right there is an Iowa nationalist. She believes Iowa should be its own country. And she believes that we should build a southern border, a big wall, to keep Missourians out. So, uh, and, and so when she was in Israel, she said, why is this called the Promised Land? This is brush, this is dirt, you know, mostly desert. Iowa is the Promised Land, I mean, it's full of corn, full of food. Why was this land ever called the Promised Land? There is no reason. Well, you can see that the reason that land is called holy, it's not economics. It has no oil. It has no large agricultural production. Why is it more valuable? It's valuable because religious belief created its value. It's only valuable because someone said, this land is what God said was important or special. It has no value otherwise. And you can see that the economic and political value are derivative. In other words, it's not the case where, you know, someone can say religion is co-opting politics. No, it's the other way around. Religion created that value for that space and now people are fighting over it by political and economic means. So, and this is the case whether it's Christianity or Judaism or Islam. So here we have a, a case from, from uh, the Islamic side where Saladin, a, a Muslim general, March 4th, it says in this account, to remove the heavy hand of unbelief with the right hands of the faith, to purify Jerusalem of the pollution of the races, of the filth of the dregs of humanity. They're talking about Christians here. So the Christians had Jerusalem at the time, 
and the Muslims want it. Same mechanism, you know, those that have that scarce resource want to keep it, those that don't have it want to get it. Every conflict works that way. Now, if you look at Osama bin Laden's fatwa of 1998, where he tells us why he's following, uh, fighting us, uh, he says, first, for over seven years, the United States has been occupying the lands of Islam. That, that goes back to the first Gulf War. Uh, in the holiest of places, the Arabian Peninsula plundering its riches, dictating its rulers, humiliating its people, terrorizing its neighbors, and turning its bases in the peninsula into a spearhead through which to fight the neighbor Muslim people. As far as bin Laden is concerned, putting missiles in that sacred space is like you allowing Russia to put missiles on the White House lawn or, or in the Vatican. You know, they're not gonna like that, that's sacred space to them. So that's what he was saying. It's about sacred space in part. So, <laughs> the next scarce resource that you see cause violence over and over, I denominate as group privileging. And that is where someone believes that they have a privilege uh, because they belong to a religious group that others don't have. So here is an example in Deuteronomy. Uh, talking about the non-Hebrews, the Hebrew author says, do not intermarry with them, those non-Hebrews, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, but this is how you must deal with them. Break down their altars, smash their pillars, hold down their sacred poles, and burn their idols with fire, which is exactly what ISIS is doing right now in the Middle East, destroying cultural artifacts they see as idols. That goes back to the Bible. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord God has chosen you out of all the peoples of the earth to be his people, his treasure possession. Now, right here, you have exactly what I'm talking about, group privileging. This group has a particular privilege that others don't. Does that lead to violence? Yes. You read on, and it says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you're about to enter and occupy, and he clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, etc. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must utterly destroy them. Make no covenant with them and show them no mercy. They have no right to life. Uh, so that's what group privileging is about. Having privileges, even life, that other groups won't have. So, and this includes, um, it's not a case where, you know, the Hebrews have gone rogue. No, it's a case where God orders them to kill. For example, in 1 Samuel 15, Samuel the prophet said to Saul the king, listen to the words of the Lord. I will punish the Amalekites, that's a particular group that lived uh, in Palestine at the time, for what they did in opposing the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep and camel and donkey. What the donkeys did, I still don't know. <laughs> but, but, you know, you're supposed to kill everyone. So the, the fourth scarce resource that has caused violence over and over is salvation. And you can think of salvation as a commodity. So a religious commodity consisting of long-term permanent benefits. So freedom from sin, God's favor, and eternal life. Eternal life is one of the big ones that have caused violence over and over because salvation is not equally distributed. You're not saved because of, by birth. Not everybody's saved by birth. Jesus said on, uh, to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So to get that commodity, you have to belong to this particular group or follow this particular procedure. You can't have it otherwise. So you created a scarce resource right there. Now. If you look at some of the uh, greatest theologians in Christianity, you will see that often they uh, believe that other people should be forced to convert because they will threaten your salvation if you don't. So here's a case where St. Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest theologians in Christianity ever, uh, is, is speaking basically about the Jews. It says, they should be compelled by the faithful, if it be possible to do so, so they do not hinder 
the faith by their blasphemies or by their evil persuasions or even by their open persecutions. In other words, you can't allow Jews to be in your society because they might convince you that Christianity is not the true uh, religion. And so you've you got to force them to convert. So you see, the, threat, the, the, the fact that Aquinas thought salvation was a commodity that, you, that could be lost led to violence, you know, the forcing of conversion. Uh, and it's very important to make a distinction uh, between what I call somatocentric ideologies and pneumatocentric ideologies. So somatocentric ideologies focus on violence to the physical body, including emotional and mental aspects. So, so a somatocentrist says the body is all you have, and that's the most valuable thing you have, and you have to, you know, uh, guarded with your life because that, that's the only thing you have, as opposed to a pneumatocentrist who says, no, you're actually composed of two things, a body and this immaterial thing called the soul or the spirit. And sometimes the soul is more important than your body. And therefore it's permissible to harm bodies in order to save your soul. And so um, here it says in Matthew, do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The reason you have to do that is because your soul is more important. And you have to remember, when Muhammad Atta flung himself into the towers on 9-11, he could care less about his body. What he wanted was to save his soul for paradise. He wanted that commodity called paradise. So bodies don't matter so much when you have a pneumatocentric ideology. And of course, uh, my book um, called The Bad Jesus focuses on the idea, challenges the idea that Jesus was a, a good uh, moral model. And of course, I, I argue he wasn't. Uh, for example, here in Luke 14, 26, it says, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So uh, it's not true that only the Muslims have violent texts, or actually, uh, if you go verse by verse, there's far more violence in the Bible than in the Quran. <laughs> and some people say, well, what about when Jesus says, uh, love your neighbor, or uh, he says to turn the other cheek? My answer is, uh, he's not preaching nonviolence, but rather deferred violence. Very important distinction. Nonviolence means you're against violence in any form at any time. Deferred violence means I want you to turn the other cheek for now, because later I'm going to come and do what it says here says, then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. In other words, I'm gonna burn you when I come back. So that part about turning the other cheek, it's just for now. It's like if I told my little brother, hey, uh, that bully that beat you up, don't, don't strike back because later I'm gonna come and burn him for you. Would that be nonviolence or would that be deferred violence? I argue Jesus does not preach nonviolence. He preaches deferred violence. So, yes, the New Testament is often more violent than the Old Testament. The Old Testament, God wants to punish you, all right, but it's just for your lifetime. It's in this lifetime. The New Testament, God wants to punish you for infinity. He wants to torture you for infinity. So the violence in the New Testament is actually infinitely greater in both quality and quantity than in the Hebrew Bible. And that's very important because often you hear Christians say, well, it's the Old Testament now that's the angry one, not the New Testament. That's the God of love. Not true in my estimation. So how do uh, religious people, especially Christians, deal with these texts? Well, there are five approaches you'll see. One is to accept. Um, so they might say, yeah, the Bible literally means what it says. You should kill children. And the violence described is perfectly moral. They had to do it. It was for defense, all kinds of 
reasons. There are others who say, no, we must reject those texts. And they should be rejected because it, it's immoral. It, that cannot be the word of God. And then there are those that relativize those texts. They might say, well, uh, those texts really mean what they say, but what was permitted then is no longer permitted. We're under a new covenant, not the old covenant idea. And then there's reinterpretation. You basically change the meaning. So it doesn't matter what it says. We're going to say it says something different now. It's called reappropriation. <coughs> now, uh, non-literalism goes a bit further and says, violence in those days is purely symbolic. It's not real. It's not true, literally. So, you know, it, or it didn't happen, literally, uh, like the genocide in the Bible. Uh, those people really weren't killed. That's just metaphorical language. So there's that approach. And this is why I think all reinterpretation is unethical and arbitrary. When you interpret any text, ancient or modern, you either have to decide that authorial intent is the only thing that matters, or it is not. If you say authorial intent does not matter, in other words, what an author intended doesn't matter, uh, then um, why don't you have someone reinterpret your words to mean the opposite of what you meant them? You think that's unethical. If, if you said, I am against violence, and someone later interprets them and says, you're for violence, you would say, that's not what I said, that's not what I meant, and it's immoral for you to say the opposite. Well, that's what reinterpretation is about. If you say that authorial intent doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what the author intended, we have the right to reinterpret them, then anything goes. You could say anything about anyone. And would you hold it ethical for anyone to, to change your words and meaning into something else? Uh, most would say no. So the better question to me is, why should we bother to reinterpret text, the Bible at all? Why should any ancient text, the Bible, the Quran, be used to authorize or guide modern behavior? That's the question that should be asked. And so I advocate what's called post-scripturalism. We have to go beyond the use of text to authorize behavior. So I have a friend who is a Mennonite, and um, he has uh, enunciated a, a pacifist principle for, for his viewpoint, the Christian viewpoint. And he said, I want to believe in a God who is nonviolent. Any depictions of God's act in conflict with these constraints must be understood as false. He has this idea, again, of the essentialist view. The true God would not do that. And if you did that, you'd have to get rid of a lot of the Bible. Uh, so you would, you would be led into what's called decanonization. The idea that you can get rid of certain passages in the Bible. They shouldn't be counted as word, words of God. And believe it or not, there are some even evangelical Christians uh, who are close to that. They say, you know, uh, we don't have to follow those texts. But I would say maybe we should, we should substitute a new principle, a new universal principle. How about this one? It is immoral to destroy life or commit any other act of violence for a resource that does not exist or that cannot be proven to exist. So if violence caused by resources that are actually scarce is bad enough, then violence caused by belief in non-existent forces or being is even worse. In other words, let's say you're fighting over water. Let's say there's not enough water. Well, you, you can verify there's not enough water. That's a verifiable scarcity. But let's say someone says, you know, I have to kill you because I have to get into, I have to acquire this commodity called eternal life. Now you're trading a real life, a real body, for a commodity that does not exist or cannot be proven to exist. And that's very different. So that's why I would say religious violence is always immoral. Religious violence is always immoral because life and bodily well-being are traded for resources that are not scarce or cannot be proven to be scarce. You're killing people, real people, for nothing or for things that don't exist or cannot be proven to exist. What exists is being traded for what doesn't exist. And what doesn't exist has no value. 
And that's why it would always be immoral to trade what exists, like human life, for something that does not exist, which has zero value. So I advocate what would be called a zero tolerance option. Any scripture that at any time endorses genocide or violence based on religious ground deserves no moral authority today. So uh, the Bible deserves no moral authority because it has episodes of genocide, and I don't care how many episodes of love it might have. If it has one episode where it endorses genocide, it's enough to declare it not a moral authority. Counter traditions are irrelevant for that reason. So the fact that someone said, well, uh, someone advocated on behalf of those people being killed, not enough. It has to be completely a rejection of that kind of violence. Historicity is irrelevant. There are some scholars who say, well, since that genocide really didn't happen historically, then the Bible is okay. I say no. It's the sentiments that count, not whether it's the historicity that counts. As long as someone had the idea that killing other groups because of their religion is a good thing, it doesn't matter whether they did it or not. So yes, it's principles that count. Now, with all that said, I have two scenarios for the future. And I announced them way back in 2005. Uh, I have a pessimistic scenario and an optimistic scenario. So let me give you the, the pessimistic one first. There will be a new global religious war fought with nuclear weapons. It's not that we haven't fought a war with nuclear weapons. World War II used nuclear weapons. But we've never fought really a religious war with nuclear weapons. And Pakistan has nuclear weapons. Israel has nuclear weapons. And Iran might get nuclear weapons. So yes, that's what you might see. There would be further targeting of sacred sites. This has actually always happened. But now you, you can see it, uh, that the Vatican is being targeted. Some, um, some congressman from Colorado, Tom Tancredo, said we should actually destroy Mecca or threaten to destroy Mecca because that's one of the five pillars of Islam and that would stop them. And I see a long-term multicultural or multi-generational war. The fact that we left Iraq and the fact that we left Afghanistan will not matter because ideologies transcend geography. And today, it, Afghanistan, tomorrow, you know, it's gonna be somewhere else. Uh, in fact, in 2010, I said, today it's Afghanistan, tomorrow it's gonna be Yemen. And sure enough, uh, it, it's Yemen right now. So, uh, and that's because this has been happening for the last two, 3,000 years. It's not gonna stop because someone pulled out of a country. It's gonna stop when the ideology ends, when the beliefs end. So <clears throat> my optimistic scenario, how do you solve it? Well, it's very difficult. But certainly you need more aggressive educational efforts that focus on non-religious approaches to solving problems. President Barack Obama saying, we're fighting against a false Islam, it's not gonna help. You're only perpetuating a religious war that way. So the effort to reverse scarcities might help. So if scarce resources are the, are the element, essential element of violence, then you reverse scarcities. Where there's not enough food, get food. Not enough energy, try to get more energy. Like trying to get energy independent uh, might be working, right? And we have to recognize violence in our own religious text. It's not enough to say, well, it's the Muslims that uh, seem to be the ones that are always fighting religious war. You don't see Christians killing, you know, people. And, and, and mostly it's true. But I say the reason Christians aren't killing people in masses right now is because they already did that. By the 19th century, they were done. You know, why do you think this country was acquired? That's because Christians came to the New World pretty much killed off or enslaved or uh, uh, put on reservations the people that oppose them. They don't have to do it anymore. That's why. It's not that they're essentially more peaceful, no. Their work is done for the most part. So yes, we have to have zero tolerance for any scripture which advocates violence at any time. So it will not do 
to, to keep saying, well, it's the Quran, but not the Bible. It's Muhammad, but not Jesus. It won't do that way because you have to admit that all religions have the same propensity. So if we do that, I would say maybe, just maybe there is hope. But, but uh, I'm, I'm very doubtful on some days that, that anything beyond going beyond religious text and religious thinking itself is going to solve the problem. So at that point, I am going to stop and ask if you have any questions. And hopefully, you will phrase them in a nonviolent way. <laughs>I'll use my own life story briefly to illustrate it. I was a um, child evangelist. I believe this stuff as strongly as any believer ever did. I, I heal people who said, I'm healed from cancer, I'm healed from this and that. How did I go from that to an atheist? How did that happen? And what happened was information. The more information I had, the more education I had, the more I saw uh, this is not true or this is uh, questionable, etc. Education to me was what made me go from this end to this end. And so that's why I'm saying the, the best nonviolent approach to changing people's mind is educating them. I teach Bible. That's a second reason I have hope. I teach Bible at Iowa State. And I have kids that come in there that are very, very, uh, sometimes fundamentalist, devoted to a particular viewpoint. And I see them change after months of studying different viewpoints. A lot of these kids come from towns where they only have one church, or they never heard of Jews, or they never heard of Islam, or, or in any serious way. And after studying the different view, they say, oh, that's not quite how I thought it was. So, there is a second reason. And the third reason I would give you is, look at what happened with gay rights, right? Had thousands of years, gay rights you know, got nowhere, basically. They were persecuted. How did it go from, you know, you can't marry to, you know, some 30 some states allowing it? Well, something happened. Education happened. You know, people got to know gay people. Uh, they were seeing them on the mass media. Uh, a lot of the civil rights movement, how do we go from segregation to non-segregation? It's television. Television made people in the North see, oh, look at what horrible things are doing down the South. And when people see, when people are educated, you have changed. We can show that. And so, no, it's not easy. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow. But the more you, you try to voice and try to challenge these ideas that there's some essential religion, there's a true religion, et cetera, the more people are gonna listen. And sometimes people, I, I debate quite a bit, you know, formally. And often I get, why do you debate? You're never gonna change people's mind. And I said, that's not true. You know, my mind was changed from debating. But the fact is, you are never addressing the people that are for you, nor the people that will never be for you. There is a segment in the middle a, a substantial segment in the middle that can go either way, depending on the information they get, depending on the sources. And the middle is your target. The people that you know are not quite convinced either or. Yes, sir. Yeah, historically, religion thrives under force. So a lot, a, lot of the, a lot of the big progress in slavery, women's rights, came when we disengaged the state from religion. You know, religion needs the power of the state to force you. Once people have a lot of choices, once you disengage the state from religion, people see more choices. And, and therefore, it's like anything else. When there's more choice, people experiment. And so that's how a lot of... Uh, religious lose their power right there. That's why uh, Muslims want to impose Sharia law and stuff like that. They know that if you, you know, are allowed to read books and different viewpoints, that's not good for them. Uh, Boko Haram, does anybody know what Boko Haram means? 
That, that's the uh, Muslim radical group that's killing a lot of people in Nigeria who abducted a lot of girls. Boko Haram, uh, at least in some translation, is books forbidden. The books forbidden group. Boko is another form of book. Haram is for, forbidden, like, like harem, like harem. And, and so the whole thing is we don't like education. Education is bad because you might learn things that are against our religion. So whenever you see uh, a lot of these religious groups, they hate education. And so obviously education is the way to, to, to penetrate that kind of ideology. Any other question? Any other question? Yes, sir. Yeah, because honor can be a scarce resource. Some people don't think they have enough of it. You know, so if someone says, I don't have enough honor from you, then that's a scarce resource. See, any conflict you'll ever see, the smallest to the next, all you have to do is find what do people not think they have enough of, and you'll find that's the key to, to the violence. So honor can be scarce for some people. They don't think they have enough. How do you change people's mind about that, though? It's, it's the same way, you know. You have to challenge, well, what do you mean by honor? Why is that honor? It's questioning. Uh, it's the start of everything. You know, sometimes people don't even think about why they believe something. And, you know, I have kids every day in my class. You know, they, they say, oh, well, uh, Jesus was the Son of God. Like, how do you know that? And they have to think about how do they know that? You know, and then they start saying, well, I actually don't know that. Somebody just told me that. You know, and do you think that someone telling you that is sufficient to establish something as true? And if they say yes, well, well, then if I'm a Muslim and somebody told me Muhammad is a true prophet, that's sufficient to establish that as true? Well, no, you know, I guess telling someone something is not sufficient. And, you know, if you just go that way, questioning is the start of everything. You have to challenge constantly people that make assumptions. You know, a lot of religious claims are based on circular reasoning. You know. God is good because God is good. That's all they're saying. You know, once you make them see that you're just reasoning in a circular way, they see you can say anything that, that way. God is not good because God is not good, see? So challenging and questioning are key. Any other question? Way in the back. Yeah, um, first of all, um, that, that's a very good question, actually. Um, one, one, I don't believe that, <laughs> that those institutions should be allowed to grant degrees, you know. But one reason is they don't have academic freedom. Uh, if you look at those religious institutions, they often have uh, confessions, statements of faith you have to sign before you even enroll in a class. How can that be possibly an academic an academically sound approach. You know, the academically sound approach says you can question. A lot of those religious institutions, you cannot question. You cannot say, I don't quite agree with that, or they might kick you out, uh, or they might downgrade you, or they might shame you. Uh, in my classes in Bible, uh, you can say anything. I don't penalize you for even believing that Jesus is good or doesn't matter. What matters to me is that you know what the different viewpoints say about the Bible. Whether you believe it or not is irrelevant to me. So you can question anything. You can say anything you want. I will not penalize you. Where in those institutions, they will. And, and the fact that they don't have academic freedom in that way is what makes them illegitimate to me. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, yes, in, in other words, um, it, it goes back to the idea that I don't say that religion causes all violence or only religion causes all violence. Scarce resource can be caused by capitalism. You know, uh, certain people that want to um, make more on, on the, the backs of other people uh, will, will cause violence. So, but my, my theory addresses the issue of when religious belief creates scarcity. It has done so 
for the same mechanism. And it's, and it's worse to me because, you know, even, say, in a capitalist society, they promise you something you might get. Uh, say, you invest in Wall Street. Uh, religion promises you commodities that you will never get. Or, you, you know, there's no way that you can verify they're ever there. Can't verify eternal life is there. But meanwhile, you're giving real labor, real capital to churches in return for that. See, and, and so that's like, uh, religion is kind of a spiritualized version of, of capitalism. Uh, it promises you rewards in return for labor that you give real people. Any other questions? By the way, has anybody read, read Piketty's work, Capitalism in the 21st Century? Uh, one, one, uh, it, you know, it was a bestseller. Uh, and one of the things that you'll notice is he hardly mentions religion as causing wealth <laughs> uh, in a good way. You know, uh, he also doesn't, is not mindful of how religion, religious uh, groups stole a lot of wealth you know, from the American Indians and so forth. I mean, uh, just slavery alone. As Christianity spread, slavery spread. And that, uh, of course, accumulated capital uh, for, for Christianity. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, so, and, and like I say, any time that you base your ethics on the supposed words of an invisible being. Imagine how bizarre that is. I mean, think about it, most people don't. Uh, you, you have somebody like uh, uh, a few presidential candidates saying, I'm running because God told me, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and think of what other things God might tell them. You know, uh, God wants me to get into a war. Uh, I think President Bo uh, George Bush said, I, went into the Middle East in part because I believe God was guiding me to create democracy. And the problem, of course, with that is that religious uh, policies are inherently anti-democratic. They're anti-democratic because a, a, a democracy is based on the idea that all of its members, all of its citizens, have potentially the same access to the information that's going to determine their destiny. But if I can't verify that God told you anything, I am not part of that democratic process now. It's, it's basically going to be your word that is imposed on me. And I have no vote as to whether God told you something. You see? And that's why religious thinking is inherently anti-democratic. Only a few claim to have access to this God, not everyone. And they're just going to impose it on you. Any other questions? Yeah, and actually, I would say, you know, people like modern creationists are actually biblically illiterate. The, the, the Achilles heel of modern creationism is not just the science, it's that they don't know how to read their Bible. Uh, if, if you read Genesis 1 in the Hebrew, it doesn't quite say what they think, you know. In Genesis 1, they believe the sky is made out of metal or some solid object. Uh, in Genesis 1, the world is created out of water. It comes out of water. It, it, there's no Big Bang. Water was the first substance. And most people, they read Genesis, they don't see it. They don't realize, because they're reading it in English. You know? And I had a debate on February 16th of last year against a creationist, uh, if you want to see it on YouTube. Uh, and he clearly did not know his Bible at all. Not at all. He couldn't read the Hebrew. Uh, he didn't know what he was doing. Uh, and that was a lot of fun for me. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, no, I, I don't believe in faith healing. I believe in faith healing is dangerous. Uh, what happened was that I was raised in a tradition that believed in faith healing. So in, in many ways, I was just replicating their beliefs. And the fact is uh, that um, a lot of people don't know enough about medicine or their own bodies 
to, to report accurately what they're experiencing. So for example, I have a lot of people who said, um, please pray to God on my behalf because I have a kidney problem. So I would pray and then you know, a week later I'd say, oh, he healed me of this kidney issue I had. What they really had is a backache, a muscle problem, not a kidney problem. They call everything that hurts back here a kidney problem. So they believe you know, it's a miraculous healing. The second thing that happens is a lot of people have received medical intervention along with uh, prayer. So you can never distinguish the results of the medical intervention from the prayer. Then historically, it, does, it makes no sense. Historically, it makes no sense at all. You know, if you take the incidence of, say, polio or uh, childhood le leukemia, uh, that was, you know, 90% uh, death rate in the 60s from childhood leukemia. Uh, now it's, you know, the other way. It's 90% survival rate from childhood leukemia. Now, why did God start caring about these children with leukemia after uh, medical science invented medicines for them? You know, why was it that God started caring about polio after the polio vaccine was invented? And he didn't care before. You know, so for thousands of years, he let people die of polio. But once medicine invented it, apparently he started caring you know, about polio victims, and now he heals them all. Right? Everybody healed the polio, is God. Well, it, once you start seeing statistically, it makes very little sense to believe in prayer or that prayer works. And of course, I, I have a whole lecture on can science prove prayer work? And I've written on this. The other thing that often is used are, are prayer experiments, where, uh, for example, the STEP study uh, uh, done at Harvard by Herbert Benson, or the Randolph Bird study uh, done at the uh, University of San Francisco, where he divides patients into those that are prayed for and those that are not. Uh, in the case of Bird, uh, it was heart patients. Uh, <coughs> and, and so then they pray for one group and then see the results. And uh, I wrote in Science Magazine, um, they interviewed me about these experiments. I said, you cannot have a, a, a scientific study of prayer. It's not possible. And the reason is, it's because you cannot have a control group that you can declare to be not prayed for. And you cannot declare them to be not prayed for because there are people praying for everybody in the world. So how do you control for that? You know, how do you know someone wasn't prayed for? There there's, could be some old lady in Cedar Rapids praying for every sick person in the world. How did you control for that? How do you know they're not receiving prayer? You can't. And if you cannot have a control group, then you cannot have a scientific study of prayer. That's why. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, it's the same way. Uh, Fran you're talking about Francis Collins. Okay. And uh, so, so um, he wrote a book called The Language of God. And, and uh, he actually does not, um, does not advocate intelligent design, but he is a Christian. And I've heard him talk about his reasons why he believes in Christianity. Very smart man. Great geneticist, uh, but when he talks about uh, biblical scholarship, he knows nothing, not a thing. You know, I, I hear his reasons like, well, people, uh, we don't believe that in biblical scholarship. Oh, we, we have uh, evidence for the existence of Jesus. There's not a single piece of evidence for the existence of Jesus in his time, not one. You know, name one, name the document. Uh, they, they don't know, so what happens is this. There are a lot of, and I know a lot of scientists like that, they know this area and they speak on this area, they don't know anything about that area. And so they make the same uh, unwise assumptions that anyone else that hasn't studied an area will make. You know, actually the biggest one is Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton was one of the greatest geniuses of all time. You know, he gave us the laws of gravitation, calculus. He predicted that Jesus would come back in 1948. <laughs> he was wrong, you know. <laughs> He was as stupid as can be when, when it came to like uh, biblical mathematics. You know, he would take numbers and <laughs> it worked for gravitation, it didn't work over here. So, uh, so actually I'm thinking my next book is gonna be about compartmentalization. That, that people compartmentalize. They, 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 will, they will use science for everything, you know, yeah, whether they're fixing their car or finding their way to this library. You're using science, the empirical method. You know, you, you're using sense data to make conclusions. And then when it comes over here, 
They won't. All of a sudden, you know, when it comes to the Bible, that you don't use empiricism anymore or empirical rationalism. Anymore. Why is that? There is no reason. So once you make them see that you're treating this subject differently and why are you doing that? How do you justify that? Then that puts them on the defensive, not you. And, and, and I have a lot of friends like that, you know. And once you start asking them, now why did you not use science over here? They can't really explain it, you know. Exactly, yes. And, 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 and I gotta go the other way too. Richard Dawkins, uh, I would say uh, he is about as biblically illiterate mm -hmm. as any, any fundamentalist. You know, you start talking about him, he doesn't know very much. And that's unfortunate because that way Christians can dismiss him very easily and say, well, you don't know anything about what you're saying. And that's why I think, in a self-serving way, that you need more atheist biblical scholars. It's the atheist biblical scholars that know where the bodies are buried. That they, they, you know, especially since they've been fundamentalists uh, themselves, like myself, I know what the arguments are. I know, I know where the, uh, the Achilles heels are. And, and so uh, it's just a matter of people talking in their area of expertise and, and not trying to talk in areas not of their expertise. That's the problem. And it afflicts both atheist and religious people, believe it or not, unfortunately. Anything else? Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't think, first of all, my, my basic philosophy of life is it's about relationships. Human relationships. Trying to make human relationships better. So if you find someone that loves you as much as you love them, that's about as good as it gets as a human being, right? As, as, as far as distribution of, of wealth and problems, I don't think you'll ever completely solve that. Something always is going to be scarce. There are too many people in the world for all the resources. So the world can't sustain everyone. And that's why you can't get rid of all scarcities, but certainly you can try to get rid of the ones that don't exist, that you shouldn't be fighting over in the first place, right? If you get rid of those, you know, you're that much better off. You know. Anything else? Well, I want to thank you very much for your, your time. And again, congratulations on your first event. I think it was very successful. I, just me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.